Well, this morning, um, I, I told the first service, my, my title will make sense at the end. Um, so if, if you follow along with the title, I still uh, think that it's, it's really mean that we require pastors to come up with their titles first <laughs> uh, to make printing deadlines. But um, if I, this is going to be a both and why and because sermon. Um, I started uh, with the text this week. It, it is our liturgical text. And I kind of read all of them, and I wanted something, um, or I was hoping that the text this week would allow for us to to be really celebratory, because that's the mood of today, as we're watching the tables go up, and um, right now, Marsha Griffith is making incredible balloon creations. Just come to the block party and ask her to make you something, (laughs) because she's phenomenally good at making balloon flowers, animals, you name it. And, um, And so as I was reading the different texts, one really did stick out to me. And I first read it in the message version, which is really where the title of the sermon came from. And so I'm just going to invite you to listen for a moment. We're not putting it up on the screen. But the message version is a a translation that was written by a guy named Eugene Peterson. And Eugene Peterson is a brilliant man who understands Hebrew and Greek not like many other people do. In fact, when he was, he first started translating um, the Psalms. That was originally how um, this text of Scripture came to be. And people reacted so well to his translation of the Psalms that he kept going and eventually did the entire Bible. Now, my understanding is is that Eugene Peterson woke up at 4 a.m. every morning and went down into his study and translated for four hours. Now, as a young seminarian, I heard that story and was terrified (laughs) that that was the life that I would have to enter into in order to understand all this. But that was his gift. It's not mine. And so I invite you to hear the words of Psalm 138. Thank you. Everything in me says thank you. Angels, listen as I sing my thanks. I kneel in worship facing your holy temple and say it again. Thank you. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your faithfulness. Most holy is your name. Most holy is your word. The moment I called out, you stepped in. You made my life large with strength. When they hear what you have to say, God, all earth's kings will say, thank you. They'll sing of what you've done. How great the glory of God. And here's why. God, high above, sees far below. No matter the distance, he knows everything about us. When I walk into the thick of trouble, keep me alive in the angry turmoil. With one hand, strike my foes. With another hand, save me. Finish what you started in me, God. Your love is eternal. Don't quit now. Will you pray with me? Lord, I ask this morning that your words would come true. God, I pray that you would hide me behind the cross of Christ and that you would speak to our hearts through your holy scriptures this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So David um, is attributed with a lot of the Psalms, but in actuality, there's actually eight that they, they really believe that, that David himself wrote. And this psalm this morning is actually the first one that he is credited with. And it is the greatest news. It is the gospel message in a psalm. Now, I know that's interesting to say because I'm talking about an Old Testament scripture, which how can we talk about an Old Testament scripture um, in light of the New Testament? But really, every single scripture in the Bible is read through that lens of Christ. Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of everything that happen in the New Testament. Seminary teaches us um, as seminarians to read the whole text, not just one specific thing. I mean, sometimes we take one specific thing and we just study every possible angle of it. Um, but, But we really have to look at the entire scripture. And when we look at any text, be it in the New Testament or the Old Testament, they they inform each other. They, there are oftentimes that if um, you're reading 
the words of Jesus, you may recognize that he's actually quoting psalms, that he's actually quoting um, messages from the prophets. Apostle Paul does this really well, too. And so a lot of times when you start reading these commentaries, you're like, oh, wow, (laughs) the Old Testament is really important to our understanding of who God is in Christ. Epic stories do this all the time. I shared this morning with the first service, thank goodness TJ was here, because I couldn't remember how many Avenger movies you would need to see to see the newest Avengers movie. Has it, does anybody see this movie? Okay, just two of us, great. Um, so in this movie, um, in this movie, there are um, like 20 Avengers. You can get so confused as to who's a normal person and who's an Avenger in this movie because there are so many. And I said to the youth group kids, I was like, let's go see this movie together. And one of the girls was like, great, but I got to watch all the other Avenger movies because I won't know who any of these people are. And so I said to our kid, who knows all about the Avengers, I said, well, how many movies do we need to watch? 18. There are 18 prequels to the movie The Avengers that just came out. So if you're, you had no summer plans and you need something to do, um, you can start watching Avenger movies. But here's why it's important. Because if you did see the most recent Avenger movies, you would understand that you kind of needed to see the previous 18 because otherwise you're like, I have no idea who this character is. I don't really understand what they do or why they're important. And um, <clears throat> yeah, so you get, you get lost in it. After my brother and I watched The Return of the King, you know, the third, but, but really then there was like all these other books, prequels to The Return of the King. There was The Hobbit. Um, and then the Fellowship of the Ring, and then the Two Towers, and then you finally get to The Return of the King. And my brother goes, that movie had five endings. (laughs) And I was like, well, no, because J.R.R. Tolkien, he had to tie it all up. There were so many pieces that were written in those beginning books that actually came to fruition in the end. Star Wars does this. Harry Potter does this. Any great story, um, you've got to read the whole thing. You can't simply just get to the end. So when we read the Old Testament, when we read the Psalms, it's where we truly begin to understand the depth of God's love. We see that God has been advocating for humanity all along. There is a historical realization that God has a plan, and it's good. Beginning with creation throughout the entire Old Testament, through God's incarnation in Christ, And right up to this very moment, that is the good news. And that entire message is wrapped up in this psalm this morning. So now we're going to read from the scripture. It'll be on the screen. Um, This is from the New New Revised Standard Version of Scripture. I give you thanks, O Lord, with my whole heart. Before the gods I sing your praise. I bow down toward your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and your faithfulness. For you have exalted your name and your word above everything. On the day I called, you answered me. You increased my strength of soul. All the kings of the earth shall praise you, O Lord, for they have heard the words of your mouth. They shall sing of the ways of the Lord, for great is the glory of the Lord. For the Lord is high in regards to the lowly. But the haughty he perceives from far away. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve me against the wrath of my enemies. You stretch out your hand, and your right hand delivers me. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me, your steadfast love. O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the work of your hands. The psalm actually divides into three different stanzas. It's a poem of David. Verses 1 through 3 is the affirmation that David is saying of God, of his wholehearted thanks for all that God has done, for God's steadfast love and faithfulness by answering prayers. And then the second section is verses 4 through 6. It says, after announcing the hope that all kings will one day acknowledge Yahweh's favor to the lowly. And finally, the psalmist in stanzas 7 and 8 voices his confidence that Yahweh will deliver him according to steadfast love. 
So this is kind of where our why question comes in, right? Why does David love God with all of his heart? Well, the because comes in the reminder of verse 2. At the second part of verse 2, um, a very wise theologian, Tremper Longman, said that verse 2 speaks of the specific focus and motivation for the psalmist's praise. He will praise God's name since his name represents character and actions. He even says that the word name in this verse, the Hebrew word for it is sem, could actually be translated reputation. Therefore, God's character, his reputation, is described by words like love, unfailing love, loyalty. And God's faithfulness and loyalty and love, that's a powerful reputation. That's the kind of reputation that I'm okay to bank my hope on, to bank my reputation on, to say to other people, this God that I serve, this God that I love, this God that I'm willing to spend my, my heart and time in worship is loving and loyal and faithful. And those words are closely connected to the covenant that God had made with his people and his commitment to displaying his love and faithfulness to the nation of Israel. And these descriptions of God's character issue forth in, in beneficial, beneficial action towards his people. By being connected with God, good things start to come about for people like David, for all of the people who, who decided to follow God. It didn't mean their lives got easier it just meant that they started to live the purpose to which God had created them and called them. Don't we, as this church, as, as the congregation sitting in here right now, want the world to know the God whose reputation is unfailing love and loyalty? Because, and here is the because, when the world sees all that God has done, that God promised to do, and then he did, and still promises even today, that's the message that we're trying to get out. Friends, that's what we're trying to do today. We're trying to fling these doors so wide open to the community around this church, to our direct neighbors, and say there is a God of love and faithfulness who desires to have a relationship with you and with me. That does not mean that we're going to bust out the four spiritual laws tracks and hand them out to people. No, it means that we're going to introduce ourselves and be good friends who love well. That's what Christ is calling us to be in this place, in our jobs, in our schools, to the baristas that we meet when we get our coffee. And hopefully a little bit of our God-loved selves shines upon the people that we encounter because we are a grateful people we are grateful for community and fellowship because we know the difference that it makes to come to a place on a sunday and know that there will be someone there who wants to know how you're really doing who cares about you who knows you who asks about your dog who cares about how it's true because god loved us first God cared for us in that way. And hopefully those feelings bubble up and, and it just becomes who we are because God is love. And God promises that he's going to answer us when he calls. That's, that's verse three of, of what David's saying. And then he says, everybody's going to hear this message. Once people hear this message, how could they turn away from it? He says the most powerful in the world will be grateful. All the kings. But also hear these words of our psalmist this morning. Because I think David recognized, and we recognize, that not everyone may be always feeling the joy and the gratitude. God desires our authentic selves. If that's all you hear this morning, just hear that part. God desires you where you are. Even when the world feels heavy and broken, we have faith and trust that God cares immensely for the vulnerable, for those that feel forgotten and not heard. And the same God did not leave us alone in the world. 
He's the one who gave his son, Jesus Christ, whose spirit dwells with us and in us. He meets us in our sadness and our grief and our illness. He meets us in frustration and anger and sometimes even those feelings of hate. Christ himself is with us, Emmanuel, God with us. And so that too is part of the good news. The words of comfort in verses 6 and 7 come from David, a man who I am incredibly grateful for. Because David was called God's beloved, but David was also a massive screw-up. And I I just appreciate that, and I find comfort in that, because I think, man, when I'm having a tough time by my own devices, I just look at David and I think, maybe I'm okay. (laughs) David understood the very heights of God's magnificent love. (laughs) He also understood the depths of oppression and fear. You'll remember that David was hunted by the current king at the time, that David lost children, friends, family members, and he is the same one that proclaims that God is with and for the lowly. God is with us in the midst of darkness and trouble. And then the closing verse might sound familiar to you. Verse 8. It says, the Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Your steadfast love, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the work of your hands. It might sound familiar because it's the Apostle Paul who writes those words to the church in Ephesus that was going through some difficult times. And he says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, he says, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. We are God's workmanship, created in Christ. The Greek word for workmanship is poiemia. I asked the first service if anybody knew what that was the Greek root word for, and someone came up to me afterwards and said, was it poinsettia? And I said, no. No. <laughs> Any guesses, second service? (laughs) Poemia, it sounds like the word that we get from it. Poem, thank you. Yes, she was at the first service. (laughs) I wasn't going to throw you under the bus. (laughs) So God is saying this to us. You are my poetry. If you've ever written a poem, I mean, I go back to school and how hard it was. You had to pick easy words to rhyme, otherwise... You'd spend all day trying to find a word that rhymed with orange. And, um, (laughs) but we are God's poetry. Think of the time and the craft that goes into writing beautiful poetry. God's saying, you are special to me, and I'm not giving up on you. I will bring about the good works that I have intended for your life. I think it's why David is able to commit himself wholeheartedly to God, to worship him in body, heart, mind, and soul. There's no legalistic obligation that is pressing David to praise God. It's coming from his own spirit of gratitude. He called out to God, and God answered him and picked him up and lifted him up and brought about the good works in him. David, and I hope all of us, cannot help but speak the sincere utterance of a grateful heart. A grateful heart signifies adoringly love that communally boasts about the beloved. That we as a community are so grateful for what God has done for us as individuals that we can't help but go out and love others. May we be people who are so grateful to know that love of God, his faithfulness to us, his loyalty to us, that he never leaves us or forsakes us, that we love God wholeheartedly and trust and hope that all of the kings of the earth and even those who feel lowly know the great love of God this day and forevermore.
Pray with me. Lord, we thank you that you brought about a good work in us that you will make sure is seen through. Father, you don't leave us out in this world to figure it out on our own, but you go with us. And that we can live a life full of hope because you are a faithful God who keeps his promises. That no matter what happens in a given week, no matter the darkness or the frustration that we may feel trapped in, Lord, you are there and you are with us and you are for us and you promise to bring about goodness in this world. We love you and we thank you and it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.